Great. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Eva Stukin. Um, Eva originally from Germany and did her undergraduate degree in Germany in private university, uh, supervised by Mike Bauer. And at that time, she already started to work on Precambrian in South Africa with Nick Bukas and his group on um, eye informations. And then she followed with PhD in uh, University of Washington working with Roger Buick and she spe specialized in nitrogen and selenium isotopes and selenium isotopes were just coming on the market at that time so her work involved uh, significant an analytical developments in this field and after it she really blossomed and uh, sort of uh, moved in a number of different fields and applications, uh, including sulfur isotopes and um, through time scale from modern to ancient and uh, using nitrogen isotope as a proxy for pH and um, working on uh, paleoproductivity and other aspects. And um, as she did a postdoc with uh, Team Lyons at UCR, when we started to collaborate together and after it, she moved uh, to University of St. Andrews, uh, where she was for several years. And in addition to all uh, diverse research she does, she supervised uh, analytical lab where uh, particularly doing uh, carbon, nitrogen and sulfur analysis. So with this, I pass to Eva and uh, welcome. All right, thanks a lot for, for having me and for the introduction. Um, so uh, yeah, so without further ado, so I'm, uh, my topic today is um, thinking more about uh, kind of hydrothermal effects on, on early life. And um, so you're probably all familiar, and obviously before I start, I should give a shout out to uh, people who've been involved in this research as collaborators um, uh, along the way. So you see them listed here. Um, so you've probably all um, heard about this idea that life may have originated around hydrothermal events. So it was first postulated in the 80s um, by this paper and that came out just a few years after black smokers were first discovered on the uh, uh, in the deep sea um, and so since then i think this this model this idea has really gained traction in the field and is probably also influencing some of the uh, sort of um, nasa missions to um to planets in the solar system to look for extinct or extend life um and but so the question that, that i'm interested in is um if these hydrothermal events if they were so successful in in, in starting life on earth and perhaps elsewhere were they maybe also important um, to sustain the biosphere on, 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 on the young planet and then maybe maybe even up to today. Um, and I think there's, there's evidence for that. So that's the question I want to address today with um, in sort of uh, two different parts. Um, so there's uh, some motivation from the modern and so there's um, over the past few years there have been more and more papers coming out um, in high profile journals showing that um, there's actually a significant iron flux coming out of events today that stimulate biological productivity in the surface ocean. So this is a particular paper where they, um, they, they showed that iron gets dispersed for thousands of kilometers in the Pacific. Um, in other papers, people showed that it stimulates productivity in, in the Arctic Ocean and surface. And um, so there's, there seems to be this, this recognition over the past few years um, in the sort of oceanographic community that hydrothermal events to, today even are, are quite important probably for, for biogeochemical cycles, more so than, than, than we used to think. Um, and of course, so they're, they're quite, Quite abundant on the, in the modern ocean. So these are um, there are several hundred that are, that are known today, um, and there are probably many more that are yet to be discovered. Um, there are reasons to think that probably hydrothermal activity was more important um, in the Precambrian than it is than it is today, and so that's based on, of course, kind of tangible evidence like planet iron formation that we can, um, we can see, um, where sort of a lot of the iron was probably um, sourced from hydrothermal vents. Um, and then those those iron formations also contain trace element evidence for a strong kind of hydrothermal signature on seawater. These are data from the Fiemann et al. who looked at uh, European anomalies um, and kind of compiled data uh, through time. Um, and so these European anomalies, they, they form because europium is, um, is the only one of the rare earth elements that can actually be reduced to a two plus state in aqueous conditions, um, but only happens at high temperature. And so, uh, so when this reduction re reaction happens, the europium changes its geochemical behavior relative to its, its neighbors and you, you get these anomalies. And so, uh, so these data are really um, kind of first order evidence that we had probably a strong hydrothermal influence on, on seawater in the Precambrian. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done and to also quantify that, but it's sort of a first, first line of evidence that hydrothermal events were probably globally important um, 
for sort of the composition of seawater. Um, and so the first part of this talk, um, I want to address um, how hydrothermal circulation could have affect, affected the nitrogen cycle um, in the early ocean, um, in particular, a kind of the recycling mechanisms of fixed nitrogen. Uh, if there's time for a second part, I'll talk a bit more about some um, sort of modeling of copper um, into in, uh, sort of hydrothermal venting of copper into the ocean, um, if, I, if I get to that. Um, okay, so uh, before I start talking more about um, kind of the rock record, um, I want to briefly remind you of how nitrogen is recycled in the modern ocean. Um, so today, most productivity, of course, happens in, in the surface ocean, um, where nitrogen is, is fixed by the biosphere. Some nitrogen comes off from, from land today. Um, from plants. Um, and so then this organic nitrogen um, eventually sinks down into the deep ocean where the vast majority of this, of this nitrogen gets remineralized to back to nitrate. Um, and so that's also what's, what's, what's defining these, these profiles of nitrate in, in the modern ocean where you have low values in the surface because it's taken up by, by biomass into biomass. Um, and then it's, it's replenished at depth as these organic particles are then being oxidized and um, recycled back to nitrate. So it's a very efficient recycling mechanism that, that's operating today. Um, and so this recycling mechanism of, this, um, of nitrogen is, is responsible, is, is really stimulating a lot of biological productivity. So it's not just the primary flux of fixed nitrogen that's, that's going into the ocean, it's also the, the recycling inside the ocean that's then stimulating productivity in the surface. But of course, we know that in the Precambrian, um, oxidants would have been scarce. Um, and uh, because of that, there's now increasing evidence that probably settling of organic matter onto the seafloor would have been much more efficient, relatively speaking. Um, and so, uh, so that means that we are really kind of losing this extremely efficient recycling mechanism that goes from organic nitrogen back to nitrate and then back to the surface ocean. Um, there would still have been some kind of just an, an, uh, anoxic um, sort of dissociation of organic nitrogen into, into ammonium. But that's just so much less efficient than this, than this aerobic complete sort of destruction and recycling remineralization process. And so the question that I, I want to address is if, if hydrothermal events could have helped with um, recycling nitrogen in some way. And of course, the answer is going to be yes, otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk. Um, so uh, just to remind everyone, so you've, of course, you've seen plots like this. Um, so uh, we know that oxygen was very low for most of its history in, in, in the atmosphere. Um, but the key point really for this, for this talk is that uh, the ocean was also anoxic for um, for most of the of our history. So, uh, um, so it was, it was probably iron rich and maybe locally um, sulfitic, but oxygen was very scarce, and that really means that nitrate would have been really um, unstable in, in most of the ocean. Um, and so that really would have um, would have suppressed this aerobic recycling mechanism that is so efficient for recycling nutrients, in, including nitrogen, but also phosphorus and other stuff today. Um, and so the first study site that I, I'm going to take you to to address this question of hydrothermal effects on the nitrogen cycle is, um, is uh, in Australia, in, in the Pilbara Craton, um, where I looked at, at rocks from the, um, the Sulphur Springs group, so it's about uh, 3.24 billion years old. Um, so this is a Google Earth image here of, um, of the Pilbara Craton sort of area. Um, what you see here are these, um, these granitoids, these big sort of light colored blobs. Um, and then wrapped around those are uh, the greenstone belts. Um, so it's kind of a, one of these sort of classic granite greenstone terrains. And so um, the fairly granite that I looked at is, is one of the smaller ones that's um, located right there. Um, yes, uh, a geological map of the Strally granite. Um, so the whole sequence has been now tilted by about 50 to 60 degrees on its side and then eroded off. And so the map is essentially really a nice cross section of the, the paleo seafloor. So we can, uh, we can literally walk from, um, from the kind of sediments that were sitting on top of the of this oceanic um, oceanic kind of crust, um, then walk through the oceanic crust and then into this into this granite that intruded that that crust at some point. Um, so these are the age constraints. Um, there's a lot of uh, so they're obviously they're not just, um, they're not they're not very tight, but uh, so it's um, there's so the idea is that these these granites kind of intruded probably maybe shortly very shortly after um, the eruption of these of these uh, volcanics and then we had sediments. Um, Probably coming down, the yeah, turbidites probably coming down um, shortly after that at the same time. So it's a, a relatively sort of short lived um, uh, system. Um, and that's, so the other thing, the key thing I want to point out are these prospects. Um, so these are sort of evenly distributed along this, um, this paleo seafloor. And what these prospects are, so they are VMS deposits. So they're volcanic mass and sulfide deposits that are being. Um, explored by various exploration companies or have been explored in the past for uh, mostly copper and, and also zinc, I think. Um, they've never, none of them has actually ever turned into a mine. 
um, but there's still um, there's still companies working up there and um, and and, um, and exploring. Um, and so what uh, what these are probably fossilized hydrothermal vents that were sitting on the seafloor at the time, and so they're kind of evenly spaced, um, as you can see more or less. And so the idea is that um, that seawater was going down in between these vents and then coming back through these black smokers um, at these prospect sites. They're now mostly manifested in the form of these Gaussian piles, which are essentially just piles of iron oxides um, and, 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 and lots of quartz. Um, and then um, locally, they're quite rich in barite. Um, so this hydrothermal barite here, the hydrothermal barium that then with um, different sources of sulfur precipitated there around these um, oops, around these vents as well. Um, and so people, so this, uh, this is now work from um, uh, ben Johnson and and, and Boss Wing, they um so they recently did a um a really nice study where they used oxygen ice strokes to reconstruct um the temperature of this hydrothermal convection cell. Um and that's what's shown here in this figure. So this is essentially a cross section of this paleo sea floor. And using oxygen ice strokes and um, inverse um, modeling, they were able to really kind of really nicely show these zones where cold seawater would have gone down into the seafloor, got heated up, and then came back up as as hot water. Um, underneath these um, these prospects so and these these discharge zones, which were them, so inferred discharge zones, um, as as these probably the black smokers. Um, it's also really nicely seen in the field. You can see this um, from the alteration mineralogy. So both of these used to be um, basaltic andesites. This one here on the right is um, has still retained some of its salt bars. Um, it's slightly chlorotized now. Um, the one on the left is completely turned to chloride and quartz. So they both started out at the exact same rock, but now they have undergone different degrees of alteration because they were sitting in different parts of this hydrothermal conduction cell. And so it's a really nice site to, to test what's happening with nitrogen um, during hydrothermal circulation. And so when I went there, I would, so unfortunately I wasn't able to get drill cores from the sort of discharge area because they're all um, under, I guess, uh, um, they're owned by various mining companies. So, but I was able to get um, drill core material from the, one of the recharge zones. Um, and so, uh, so these are. This is now some of the of the of the turbidite of the sediments that were sitting on top of uh, of this of this volcanic um, of the volcanic pile of the seafloor. Um, and so I sampled these these sort of organic rich, uh, rich black shales. Um, and then that uh, that core extends down into the into the hydrothermally altered um, seafloor. So in this case here, it's a it's a day site. Um, you can still see a lot of the anecdotes that are preserved there now filled with quartz. Um, you see it's kind of turning this sort of yellowy color. That's the, the sericide alteration um, at the top of the volcanic pile. Um, and you also see that it's very, very strongly fractured by, by these various quartz veins. Um, and in fact, this, this up here on, on the left hand of this photograph, this is the, um, this is the, um, the so-called marker chert. So that's just a, a very thick, up to 20 meters thick um, chert unit, which represents a very heavily solidified part of the, so the bottommost part of the sediments that were sitting on top of the volcanics. Um, and so I have sampled this whole kind of cross section. I also got a few samples um, in the field that go deeper down into the recharge zone, and then a few um, of the kind of discharge zone samples from the field. Um, and so this is the, the, now the, the data from, um, from this drill core and a few outcrop samples. And so, uh, so what I'm showing here is um, total organic carbon, total nitrogen, and C2N ratios. These are nitrogen ice groups and C2S, uh, C2S ratios. Um, and so first, uh, just look at the, the TUC values. And so as you can see, so these are in um, logarithm of PPM. So uh, so we get up to sort of 10,000 of PPM. So we get into the percent range of, of total organic carbon in, in these um, in these black shales, which is kind of fairly um, typical for these um, yeah, for, for these sort of rock types. So it's not unusual. Um, and then as you go down, as you probably would expect, as you drop down into the volcanic rocks, you just have a few PPM, tens of PPM of organic carbon um, and that's probably what you would expect in a volcanic rock, so it's very low. Um, but if we look at nitrogen, um, we see a similar pattern that it's high in the, in, the, in the sediments and then it drops down, but it doesn't drop nearly as much. So it's about an order of magnitude drop compared to two to three orders of magnitude. And so as a consequence of that, um, the C2N ratio um, decreases. So there's, uh, we have more nitrogen still present relative to carbon in these rocks. Um, nitrogen isotopes kind of stay at the top here, they stay within um, causes of a familiar to you for the most part of the, of the sedimentary values. So they're not, they're only slightly fractionated. Um, and so the interpretation of, of what we are seeing here is that um, initially, so uh, we have these, these black shales plotted up here and these, these gray dots. Um, then on, down here in yellow, I've marked the magmatic backgrounds. So these are, um, these are granifiers, which are sort of the most volatile, rich part of the, of the, sort of the, the felsic intrusion. 
which you would expect to be um, magmatically most enriched in, in, in ammonium and nitrogen just by sort of purely magmatic processes. And so, um, so what we think we are seeing here is that uh, um, initially these, these organic rich sedimentary rocks were um, permeated probably by hydrothermal fluids because we see as we step down into these very heavily solidified um, rocks into the church um, that the uh, both carbon and nitrogen uh, decrease. So probably these hydrothermal fluids were leaching organic matter and, and nitrogen um, from, from, organic, from these sediments. Um, but then what's important is that if we, as we step down into the, into the seafloor, into these hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks, that we start seeing, again, this increase. Um, so we, we start seeing an increase in nitrogen relative to carbon, essentially. So, uh, so it looks like, um, so as I said, the C2N ratio is much lower. And so it seems that we are enriched in nitrogen relative to, to, to carbon backgrounds. And we also enriched relative to the magmatic backgrounds. So it looks like these rocks have been, they have been sort of secondarily enriched in, in nitrogen. Um, and in fact, the most likely host mineral for this nitrogen is the sericite, which you can kind of see here. So these are some, uh, some quartz grains in this little sericite here that probably may, may, maybe used to be a feldspar at some point, um, and it's not completely sericitized. And so sericite is, um, is a potassium-rich mica, and uh, potassium has a very similar um, uh, uh, size, so I um, ionic uh, radius as ammonium. And so ammonium likes to substitute for potassium in, in minerals, and so uh, it's the most likely host for, for ammonium in these blocks. And so what, what, what we think we're seeing is that um, hydrothermal fluids have most likely picked up ammonium from these black shales um, at the top from these turbidites um, and transported them down and um, enriched these, um, these hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks in ammonium. Um, there's more sort of independent evidence for where the nitrogen most likely came from. And so this is just um, this is looking now at carbon sulfur ratios. Um, in these rocks and I've also kind of penciled in here the uh, line that represents um, a batch of about 10 samples of the same um, formation, the Sonesville group, um, or this, um, the same sort of uh, shale formation, but um, very sort of distal to, to this hydrothermal um, horizon. Um, and so those, those really distal shales have very consistent C2 S ratios around, around uh, 30, um, plus or minus a, a few. Um, whereas in these black shales, which have very similar organic carbon levels, we see enrichment in sulfur. And that's also quite obviously seen here in, in this background picture where you have these pyrite veins that are cutting across. Um, so we have evidence that these hydrothermal fluids were indeed also circulating through the sediments. So in other words, this hydrothermal system was sort of active as you know, the bottom, at least the bottommost sediments were already um, deposited. Um, and so it's really plausible that these hydrothermal fluids were picking up ammonium from those organic rich black shales. Um, and so, this, in fact, this is so the reason why it's this is interesting is because it becomes it's it's really similar to what people have previously documented from from modern systems. Um, so this is here transect from the um, from oceanic crust in the Pacific Ocean in the modern Pacific Ocean, and um, so what you see here is essentially kind of the same thing. So in this plot here on the left hand side, you see nitrogen concentrations, and you see the strong enrichment here towards very similar concentrations as what we see, you know, 15 ppm, something like that. Um, and isotopically, this, this uh, nitrogen is also similar to the sediments that are sitting on top, which are not plotted here. But so there are these so zero per mil values, which are kind of sedimentary. Um, lighter values down to minus five per mil or lighter. Um, those are more sort of the typical magmatic nitrogen values that you would expect. And so it looks like um, similar to what we see in the, in the Archean, we have this enrichment of, of sedimentary nitrogen um, into the altered, hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks. And um, so the, the reason why this is interesting is because um, also from modern systems, we know that black smoker fluids that are associated with sediments um, tend to be very rich in ammonium. And so um, again, I wasn't from this particular locality, I wasn't able to um, to really sample sort of any of the sort of discharge samples that would have maybe shown that. You'll see that in, this, in the next, um, next uh, part of the talk. But um, so what we know from modern systems, um, these are now data from a, an old paper where they measured black smoker fluids. Um, and uh, so these three black smokers that are associated with sediments where they have this, the same kind of um, circulation of fluids through sediment packages, um, they're very, very enriched in ammonium. So just for comparison, um, nitrate in the modern ocean is around 30 micromole. Um, and so here we have about a millimole up to maybe a uh, um, few tens of millimoles. So we're talking about two to three orders of magnitude enrichment um, in nitrogen in these black smoker fluids that have circulated through sediments in the modern ocean. Um, and so it's, of course, it's the same sort of mechanism that we have some biomass sitting in the sediments. So this up here would be um, the biomass, and then these hydrothermal fluids come along and start altering this biomass and 
um, they rip out um, some of the ammonium um, and, uh, and, and uh, transport that separately or you know, kind of um, ex expel some of that into, back into the, into the ocean. Um, and so I think this, this, is, this is an indication that these fluids were really acting, um, so they are acting today and also in the past acting as, a, as another recycling mechanism. Um, of, of nitrogen, perhaps other nutrients. So today um, we have this really efficient remineralization of nitrogen in the, within the ocean, within the water column, where nitrogen is oxidized to nitrate and then upwelled back to the surface. Um, we didn't have that in the past, but um, what we did have at least locally in hydrothermally active basins um, was sediment deposition. Um, we had hydrothermal fluids that might have, might have, might have um, recycled nitrogen essentially post deposition, but um, brought some of the nitrogen and back to the ocean and could have stimulated productivity in a similar fashion as, um, as, as what's happening today. Um, so you might not be entirely satisfied with uh, the fact that I couldn't demonstrate um, sort of the outpouring of, of nitrogen into the ocean, but um, so, uh, so we've done um, another kind of uh, study of this, um, to test this further, um, looking now at Pudrozoic rocks. Um, and so now this is going now to the MacArthur Basin in Australia. Which is one of the which hosts one of the, the world's largest zinc deposits. It's a sedimentary axillative deposit, so it means that um, so these were um, hydrothermal vents or seeps that were kind of seeping out or venting out into into the ocean into so within um, within the sort of sediment package, and so the, the fluids were circulating through sediment packages. Um, and so uh, um, this is just briefly kind of the the stratigraphy of the um, of the MacArthur Basin. So um, it's kind of subdivided into two groups. There's the Tawala group at the bottom here, the, the older part, which um, people think is, uh, is probably represents the rift phase of this basin. So it contains um, a lot of kind of uh, terrestrial sediments, so a lot of fluvial um, sandstone conglomerates and so on, and very shallow marine sediments, so including evaporites um, and lots of red beds. Um, and then on top of that is uh, the MacArthur group, which is um, mostly just marine. So it contains lots of carbonates, um, calcareous shales, and some relatively deeper water fasces, which are um, these black shales, including the Bonnie Creek Formation, BC here. So that's the, um, the main horizon that I studied. And it's also the main um, ore sort of hosting horizon. So that's where all the zinc, um, zinc is hosted, zinc and lead. Um, and so the idea is uh, kind of a genetic model for the ore deposit is that the Chihuahua group acted as a source of the metals. So the fluids were circulating through the Chihuahua group, through these sandstones. Um, they picked up a lot of salt from the evaporites. Um, and so then these saline fluids were also picking up metals from the sandstones. Um, and then those fluids came up along faults um, and um, were kind of expelled into the Bagatha Basin during the deposition of the Bonnie Creek Formation. Um, and because this was now a bit deeper water and oxidic at the time, um, this Bonnie Creek Formation then really was able to trap, or the sediments at the time were able to trap the, the metals that were coming up. Um, so that's, that's kind of schematically shown here. So we had, uh, there were these um, cinder positional faults in the basin um, where the fluids were able to come up um, and then they were expelled into the into the into the ocean um, during deposition of the MacArthur of the Bonnie Creek formation um, and the metals were trapped. Um, and so I was able to um, through um, through collaborators I was able to get uh, drill core samples from this Bonnie Creek formation from six drill cores with varying distance from the, the main deposit. Um, so uh, going from about uh, one kilometer, let's say that's the fringe of the actually actual ore deposit over all, all, the, all the way to about 55 kilometers away from the main deposit um, to really test if there is a distinct signature of this hydrothermal fluid that's coming up. Um, and so uh, these are the data. So this is now looking at carbon nitrogen ratios versus nitrogen isotopes. Um, here are organic carbon isotopes, and this is plotted versus distance. And so uh, for each core, I, I don't have a large number of samples, but um, it, it, so the samples that we do have, they, they seem to show um, a trend here. So that uh, if we look at the samples from this um, F1189 core, which are the closest to the ore deposit on the fringe of the, of the kind of hydrothermally influenced uh, sort of the oriole directly, um, they have um, systematically kind of lighter nitrogen nice isotope values and C2N ratios, lower C2N ratios than um, samples from a bit further away. Um, there's no such trend in the carbon isotopes, but so for C2N ratios and nitrogen isotopes, we can we can sort of make out this this this, this trend here. And so what this would suggest is, um, so the low C2N ratios mean that we have an excess of nitrogen relative to organic carbon. So we have more nitrogen than, than you would expect just based on the from the carbon alone compared to compared to the other rocks. And so uh, so what that really suggests then is that we probably had an additional source of nitrogen um, to these these sediments at the time of deposition. 
which had also, an, uh, and this, this nitrogen salt had a distinct isotopic composition. So it was probably isotopically lighter compared to the sort of the rest of the nitrogen that was available in the, in the rest of the basin. Um, and so I think this is good evidence that, um, that these fluids did in, in fact carry nitrogen and expel that and expose that to the, to, sort of, to the local environment and create sort of a nitrogen rich um, little sort of ecosystem perhaps. Um, where does the nitrogen come from? So people have previously, this is um, Ken Williford, people have previously um, looked at um, organic biomarkers in these rocks. And so in this particular study, they looked at polyarometric <clears throat> hydrocarbons, which are very kind of thermally resistant um, organic molecules. Um, and so uh, they measured the organic carbon isotopes in those, and they also did sort of a bit of a, um, a, a gradient here with distance, so not on a much shorter distance than, than what I looked at, but they were able to, um, to use the carbon isotopes that they measured um, to fingerprint um, those back down to the Wallach Rang formation, which is this, uh, this gray unit here in the, down in the Chihuahua group. Um, so it's the only really organic rich um, um, unit that's, that's in the Chihuahua group. And it looks like based on these carbon isotope values, um, that, that that unit um, probably also released some hydrocarbons into these hydrothermal fluids as they were coming up along those faults. Um, and, uh, and so most, most plausible is that um, those same, the, the, the same fluid was also, was not just picking up zinc and, and, and salts as it was traveling through the, the Chihuahua group, but it was probably also picking up um, hydrocarbons and, and probably also ammonium from these organic rich um, units such as the wall grain formation. Um, and so it's a, uh, an example where, kind of similar to the Achaean example, um, where we have evidence that hydrothermal fluids were recycling nutrients that had kind of long been buried, and these fluids were kind of able to pick up this, these nutrients and bring them back up to the surface, and recycling them, make them available for kind of a next, I guess, next generation of microbes. Um, so it's, a, it's, yeah, it's another example of, of this recycling mechanism, and now we can actually see evidence of it coming back out into the, into the ocean. Um, so in summary for this part, um, we see from the Achaean that we have this transfer of ammonium into the seafloor. Um, and from the, from the Proterozoic, we see evidence of ammonium coming back out. And these two combined, 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 uh, combined also with um, analogs from the, or with, with modern analogs or evidence from the modern ocean are really suggesting that hydrothermal fluids could have been important kind of sites of, of recycling nutrients I mean, created kind of maybe local hotspots of productivity perhaps um, around them in, 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 in individual basins. Um, so that's the first part. Um, with the second part, um, I want to now talk about not just recycled nutrients, but actually a, a primary nutrient that would have been expelled into the ocean by hydrothermal vents. Um, and this is, uh, this is copper in this case. And so this is a project that I, I did um, during the first lockdown when I was just um, stuck at home. And so it's, uh, it's entirely just kind of modeling based. Um, and so it's it's kind of motivated by by this paper, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this paper by uh, Max Seidel et al., which uh, was very influential on on our community, I think, um, where they uh, they did these kind of thermodynamic models to test the solubility of, of copper and other other uh, metals um, through time with different kind of ocean water compositions. And so they at the time they what they found based on what people thought the composition of the ocean was that was that um, in the Proterozoic, especially, and also in the Achaean, copper should have been about 15 orders of magnitude lower in seawater than it is today. Um, and so that has really stimulated a lot of ideas about um, limitations of the biosphere by um, the copper and, and zinc and other stuff. Um, but so subsequently, so in, in more recent years, people have started to generate data from, from shales and, and iron formations and other rocks and other sedimentary rocks. And, um, and they have not, so there isn't really, so far there is no evidence for this 15 order of magnitude copper depletion. And so, um, so it kind of begs the question then, so if copper wasn't 15 orders of magnitude depleted, um, what was then actually sustaining it? What was, what was keeping it in, in solution? What, what, where did the copper come from? Um, and so, um, so the two questions that I'm addressing here with this model is if hydrothermal vents could have acted as important point sources of copper. Um, and I'm also exploring the role of organic ligands and stabilizing copper in seawater. Um, this is kind of a, so the idea is also kind of stimulated from this particular paper about the modern ocean. So these are, um, these two people, Sander and Kuczynski, they, so they study modern hydrothermal vents. Um, and so um, what they did is they, um, so they, 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 they did their own measurements and then um, also modeled those um, with a um, sort of geochemist workbench model. And they found that in today's ocean, 90% uh, of, the, of the world's iron and 40% of the copper is probably coming from um, black smokers, and it's all the copper is held in in these organic complexes. So there's the copper L, so L stands for ligand, organic ligand, um, 
um, HI is hydrothermal ligand and SW that seawater is there, ligands from seawater and ligands from hydrothermal vents that collectively stabilize this copper in solution. Um, and that's how these vents are able to um, maintain some of the, of the modern marine copper budget. And so I wanted to um, um, take their model and kind of uh, modify it a little bit and apply it to the Precambrian essentially. Um, and also I did it a little bit differently. So they, um, um, they really just focused on kind of a um, thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamic model of the hydrothermal fluids. Um, I kind of added this into a box model that I could also consider the river flux, which has changed through time. Um, it was much lower in Yakian, of course, before oxidative weathering. Um, and I, I accounted for kind of different settling rates with different residence times and so on. Um, but the important part for the hydrothermal fluids is that um, I used a similar kind of um, thermodynamic approach with geo geochemist workbench, where I had um, a black smoker fluid that was very copper rich, and I mixed that black smoker fluid with, um, with seawater. And then I let it, I let them, I let the two fluids mix um, in different proportions, and I essentially watched um, precipitation of copper. Um, and as soon as the precipitation had stopped, I then took the composition of that fluid and used that as input into my, my box model here, sort of the hydrothermal end member after precipitation has ceased. Uh, and this fluid is now mixing with the global ocean uh, and you know it kind of dispersed into the global ocean. Um, so these are just um Briefly, um, what these fluids look like. So I used a modern seawater composition, and then, uh, and in terms of sort of you know calcium, magnesium, chlorine, chlorine, and so on, major ions. Um, and then the main variables that I changed were iron concentrations, sulfur concentrations, and oxygen. So I just had these kind of three, three different scenarios. Um, as um, and I so in, in in the paper that uh, the way this is described in more detail, you can also look at some sensitivity tests for this. Um, and so I added organic ligands and 10 nanomoles. So this is the same concentration as in the previous um, modern paper that they that they um, did. Um, and then for the hydrothermal fluid, I used again kind of the same composition um, with different amounts of organic ligands added in. And so these fluids are mixing. That's the, the mixing ratio of hydrothermal to seawater. And you see that the temperature is, um, is dropping as they mix, as you would expect. Um, and uh, so then, as I said, I, I watched kind of when precipitation stops, and that's the fluid that I used for the box model. Um, this is what the what this looks like. I'm just going to show this briefly for the modern. Um, so uh, this is uh, copper speciation now during this mixing process. Um, and so you see at high temperature, um, copper is initially bound in this in a sort of aqueous sulfide complex. Then it turns into a chloride complex and eventually just pure copper. But the total concentration, you see that dropping. And that's because of precipitation uh, and, of course, also dilution by seawater. But, um, so the precipitation is happening along the way and pulling copper out of um, out of solution. Um, but what you see is um, as soon as I start adding ligands to this model, so this is now just a bit of um, 10 nanomoles of, of ligands in seawater, um, you see that copper is now being held as this organic ligand complex. And then when I start adding uh, ligands also to the hydrothermal fluid, um, now this, this red line pops up, which is now the hydrothermally, um, so the, the, the copper bound, um, the ligand bound copper that's uh, Found now in the side by the side of thermal ligand, and the total concentration in the final fluid keeps increasing um, with with the addition of these ligands. Um, so the ligands really help in stabilizing copper in solution. Um, and then I put that into this box model, and so the results that I got for these four different scenarios that are shown here: um, blue is always the riverine um, input, and then in black is the hydrothermal input. Um, and so I got that between two to twenty percent of the marine copper budget would be supplied by hydrothermal vents, which agrees quite well with the with the fourteen percent that the the previous paper got. Um, even though they had a slightly different approach, but it's um so it's was satisfying that the model kind of seemed to work. Um, and so then when I applied this to the Achaean, as you would expect, uh, because the um the river flux is essentially shut off, it's it's very very small. Um, hydrothermal vents now make up the the vast uh, majority of the of the copper supply to the ocean. Um, so the river flux is is um, is, is really um, really negligible almost. Um, but what you also notice um, for these uh, scenarios, which are so these are now the maximum amount of ligands that we would find in modern, um, the total concentration of copper in the ocean is is low. It's um, it's not 15 orders of magnitude lower, but it's about six orders of magnitude lower than than in the modern. Um, so uh, and so the, the only way that I found to to increase and to push copper towards more like sort of similar to modern levels was by either increasing the amount of ligands. And so that's something that is um, that is really poorly known. So we don't know how much organic matter was kind of suspended or dissolved in, in Achaean seawater or pre-Cambrian seawater. Um, so if the ocean was sort of more organic rich, um, um, perhaps more copper could have been held in solution. 
And another interesting result that I didn't expect, but that um, came as a bit of a surprise was that also if I increase the temperature of the ocean by um, a few tens of degrees, um, it also increases the concentration of copper in, 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 in seawater because it turned out that the, the solubility of, of copper sulfide minerals is quite temperature sensitive. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so I know that temperature is a very controversial topic um, in the Achaean Ocean, um, but if temperatures were only maybe only a little bit higher than today, this is today's value with uh, four degrees for the deep ocean, um, then perhaps, or maybe even maybe even just in basins that were hydrothermally very active and maybe a little bit sort of regionally a bit warmer, um, maybe in those basins, copper could have been, uh, copper concentrations could have been elevated. Um, and so those could have then maybe really helped also with supplying um, this important nutrient. <clears throat> And looking to the Proterozoic, um, so now uh, the weathering flux is turning on and um, most copper in, in rivers today is organic bound. And so if we treat the copper as an organic bound kind of ligand, so it um, disperses in the ocean um, and it actually becomes, so we, we start seeing concentrations that are similar to the modern, in fact, and the uh, hydrothermal events um, lose in importance. So they become also similar to modern um, or a bit lower. Um, but uh, so what's interesting is even if we decrease the residence time of copper in the ocean, because we think of these, um, you know, exinic, um, exinic uh, wedges along ocean margins, um, the copper concentration does drop by maybe an order of magnitude, but it's still within 10% um, or a few percent of modern levels. So it's not 15 orders of magnitude depleted um, compared to the modern. Um, and so I think this really shows quite nicely that um, these organic ligands, which are holding copper in solution, um, are, really, are really good at maintaining a copper budget um, and that could really nicely explain why, why observations um, deviate from the sort of original model where these ligands were not considered. And it could maybe also mean that the, the biosphere was not copper limited in the Proterozoic, or not as much as we used to think. Um, and so this is just kind of summarizing that. So this is my um, sort of best guess for copper through time with, with sort of the plausible range of values. Um, and this plot down here shows the contribution of, um, of, of hydrothermal events in percent, so from almost 100% in the Achaean to a um, few percent, a few tens of percent uh, Proterozoic to modern. Um, and so, yeah, so in conclusion, um, copper was probably not as limiting as we used to think, and um, organic ligands combined with hydrothermal events would have been probably quite important for sustaining this budget. And so, yeah, so these are the, the two conclusions. I'll leave you with those. And uh, I guess, yeah, if you see hydrothermally altered rock in, rocks in the future, don't throw them away, but uh, write me an email and then we can. Uh, try to, to see if we can see evidence for, for some of these processes in those. Okay, so thanks again, I was happy to take any questions. Great, thanks a bunch, Eva, really great. Uh, we have, it looks like we have a couple questions already. Um, Paul Hoffman asked one just a few minutes ago when you were describing uh, your model in the context of Sander and Koshinsky. Um, and his question was, how would the story change if Archean seafloor spreading was absent and mid-ocean ridges did not exist as some workers infer? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we see from the, just from the Sulphur Springs group um, where we had from, you know, from the Pilbara Craton, where some people say we had the sort of vertical tectonic style um, that we had quite active hydrothermal venting um, even in a completely different tectonic regime. So I don't think that's an issue really. Um, and there are many hydrothermal events associated with kind of um, um, uh, what are they called uh, hotspots, and uh, so they. I don't think they, they. I don't think it's necessary to have sort of modern style mid ocean bridges. I think there are enough examples in the rock record that show that it's possible um, to have a lot of hydrothermal activity without that. Um, of course, it impacts, I guess, how we would calculate kind of a total rate of hydrothermal circulation in the past. Um, so that's that's probably very difficult because we just don't know exactly. Um, how this would change. Um, I guess that's my best answer for now. All right, thanks for the, for the answer. Um, we ne next have a question from Francis and then from Greg Retallick. So go ahead, mm -hmm. Francis. Okay. Hi, uh, Eva, thanks. That was a really great talk. Um, I have a question related to uh, the rapid silicification of sediments and lithologies during the, pa the paleo meso mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, it's, it's something that's it's always in my mind with respect to recycling, cycling of hydrothermal fluids, because we, 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 we can trace the hydrothermal fluids 
you know, coursing through these sediments. But at the same time, we know that they, uh, they were very rapidly lithified. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I wondered what, you know, what your feeling about this is. I mean, for, for, uh, mm -hmm. it's to me that it means that it's, uh, the, the recycling has to be extremely rapid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think, again, looking at the Sulphur Springs group, we see the solidification most intensely at the bottom of the sediment pile, in the bottom maybe 10, 20 meters. Um, but we still see like, fairly extensive hydrothermal um, veining in terms of sort of pyrite veins um, above that. And so I'm, I'm wondering if perhaps a lot of the silica actually drops out relatively early um, at relatively high temperature, but then we still have fluids circulating at slightly lower temperature um, above that, where it's maybe not solidifying as much anymore, but it's still able to to leach um, yeah, to leach things like ammonium and other stuff out of the sediments. Um, so that's that's maybe one one point. And the other point is, I guess, when we look at this marker church, um, this very heavily solidified rock, it's, it's actually it's, it's quite ammonium poor. And so uh, it seems to me that despite the rapid solidification, these sewers were able to to leach organic matter and ammonium out of those. Um, those rocks, and I, yeah, it's a good question how that how that happens. I don't I don't know. So um, I guess it seems that, um, yeah, maybe yeah. I'm I'm sure how these fluids really interact with the sediments. So if maybe they they if they so you have these hot fluids, these silica rich fluids coming in, maybe they're displacing pre existing poor fluids that are then heated and expelled, and maybe those fluids are taking the ammonium with them. Um, so it could there could be a mechanism like that perhaps, but that's definitely interesting to maybe explore further. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I, I also have a comment, and that is uh, lo looking, you know, looking at the biosignatures, there seems to be a concentration of uh, chemotrophic biosignatures uh, colonies uh, in and around the, well, ar around the hydrothermal vent exits. So this sort of, um, mm -hmm. your, your theory uh, it gives one explanation as to why they are there, because it's not just any nutrients, it's also the, the nitrogen that's coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Um, there are some, yeah, some studies that have looked at um, again nitrogen isotopes in, in modern vent fauna, and they find a really wide range of fractionations. Um, and this extremely wide range of fractionations is, is, is kind of pointing towards um, a fairly large nitrogen reservoir that's down there that these these microbes are tapping into. Um, and so uh, it's not. It's again, it's, as far as I know, it's not been really very well established of what exactly is happening in these vent communities in terms of nitrogen. Metabolisms, but um, there seems to be um, just based on these really fairly large isotopic fractionations. There seem to be a uh, quite diverse and probably also tapping into a large reservoir of nitrogen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to express these large fractionations. So I think that's that could be part of what's what's driving them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. End of my questions. Great talk. Oh, thanks. Sir. That was lovely, Eva. I really enjoyed that, and um, you've convinced me. Um, okay. Copper, <laughs> about twenty percent of the copper is ligand bound and. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it, it might have always been that way, that there wasn't, a, uh, that the difference between the Archean and the Paleozoic might not have been so profound. And the reason I'm thinking that is because mm -hmm. Sue Brantley's group had a lovely paper, the senior author was Neiman, who I don't know, um, on ligand-based weathering of um, Precambrian Paleosols. Mm -hmm. And um, they were looking at the, at the mobilization of uh, phosphorus, not copper. Mm -hmm. But they actually found that in the Archean, it was more intense than it was uh, subsequently. Uh, and um, a lot of the paleosols we've been studying show that in the Archean, there appears to have been a sulfur-based weathering, which was extremely mm -hmm. aggressive. It pH is like that of wine, like three instead of peri-neutral. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the if Archean weathering might have been a pretty significant source of copper, um, ligand bound and otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. But the reason why it wasn't quite as significant then may be that there wasn't quite as much land area to do the job. <clears throat> yeah, I think that yeah, probably the land area might, uh, might, might, might be sort of the most important argument. Um, and uh, yeah, I, think, so the, the, I got this copper flux from Yakian from the recent paper by Howe and um, uh, what's his name? Um, Bob Hazen. So they did this, they, they modeled Archean weathering under kind of realistic, um, a plausible sort of uh, rainwater compositions uh, with high CO2 levels, um, you know, oxygen. And so they, they derived this, this copper weathering flux. And so I, I don't think they necessarily included intense sulfur weathering, sulfur-based weathering, but I'm also, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, yeah, definitely, I guess you're, you're right. There could have been locally um, probably um, 
in terms of leaching by sulfides. But then on the other hand, Achaean marine sediments are not very sulfur rich. And so I, I, if we sort of then kind of scale that up, then it would probably also mean that the um, kind of the sulfur driven weathering flux of copper would have been a relatively minor contribution, I would think. Um, but I agree with your point about the organic weathering um, and organic ligands in, in kind of Achaean soils. So I, I think I know the paper you're talking about. And um, it's definitely a, an interesting point. I think it could be good evidence that there was already, already sort of maybe ligand bound stuff coming off land at the time. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're mentioning, you're mentioning um, hydrolytic weathering, which is basically what Dick Holland did for all those years and what I was working with as well. Um, that was, that's the old model, which is based on carbonic acid and probably cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm changing my mind. Um, I do do that occasionally. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that sulfur bacteria using sulfuric acid is a more mm -hmm. likely weathering regime to model for the Archean than the old fashioned cyanobacterial hydrolysis model. Mm -hmm. uh, and that changes everything. Um, that changes quite a bit about the fluxes that you can expect from um, Precambrian soils. And we've always been puzzled that these Archean soils are so shot, so deep, so short of nutrients. It's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting to, to look at that some more. Mm. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, we've got another question for you in the chat from Nadezda Alfamova. Thanks for the presentation. If hydrothermal system Sorry, if the hydrothermal system was recycling nutrients, is there in the complexes that you studied beds which might have trapped nutrients benef benefited from these nutrients? Um, yeah, I think in the so in the in the Barney Creek formation, we probably see evidence of that in the in the most proximal core. Um, and so, in fact, what I didn't show is um, from kind of the carbon nitrogen ratios and um, looking at sort of the intercept of the on the nitrogen axis dot nitrogen versus carbon. Um, it's, it's suggesting that the nitrogen was really bioavailable and not just added to clay minerals or something like that. And so, um, so I think that's um, that's the place I would point to to say that uh, we probably see evidence there of um, of nutrient availability directly to um, to the biosphere that was living next to this vent. Um, but then also, I guess, um, yeah, just the the zinc itself, of course, is a, is a nutrient that would have come out of the ocean um, and this oxy forming ore deposit there. So it's, um, so yeah, so that the Barney Creek formation is, is just a nice example of, uh, of local enrichment um, in kind of hydrothermally sourced nutrients, either recycled or primary, I think. Okay, Francis followed up with another question. Um, the, cy the cyanobacteria came in relatively late, about three GA, what about before? Uh, how about before? Um, I, I I don't know. I think it's it's probably um, probably mostly the phylogeneticists who are probably best placed at answering that question. I think perhaps with um, but of course they rely on on anchor points from 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 us. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I th I wouldn't want to necessarily you know sell my soul to a specific date of when cyanobacteria originated. Um, but I I would like to think that perhaps these processes like hydrothermal recycling of nutrients may have helped in maybe stimulating also some, some innovations, um, some evolutionary innovations. Um, so yeah, if, because I guess the more productivity you have, the more just, you know, cell divisions you have and the more, the more errors you can make during mutations and so the more likely you are to maybe evolve something new and to invent something new. And so I think, uh, I think if we have the more hotspots of productivity that we can create in, in the ocean, um, the more likely we are to maybe also kind of advance the biosphere to something new. And so, um, so perhaps, um, Perhaps these kind of processes could have maybe contributed um, um, indirectly to what's uh, you know, evolving, maybe also say on bacteria somewhere. So we do from, know from the modern ocean that in the in the Arctic Ocean, um, there was a paper that I mentioned in the beginning that uh, where they showed that hydrothermal vents disperse iron all the way up into the photic zone, um, even today. And so this iron is stimulating um, algal blooms up there. And so um, so it looks like yeah, if this process was already operating in, 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 in the past. Obviously, we know from Ben iron formations that iron was going up to the photic zone. Um, so yeah, why not? Why it definitely could have stimulated productivity up there as well, including phototrophs. All right. Yeah, if anybody 
would like to unmute themselves and comment or anything, feel free as well. Um, at the moment, we don't have any any new comments in the chat. So I'll give people some seconds yeah. to finish up thoughts. Andre, did you want to ask something? Yeah, Eva, um, so in terms of dissolved organic carbon, uh, we kind of have two competing processes. On one hand, uh, productivity probably was much lower in Precambrian or in Archean. On the other hand, preservation was uh, much better. So I'm wondering if uh, ligands would bind also other metals. So can you create a system with multiple uh, metals and try to constrain through uh, how much dissolved organic carbon was in the ocean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting idea, I guess. I think, didn't uh, Kurt Kornhauser, they used banded ion formations to kind of work out the ratio of metals in, in the ocean. And so maybe maybe one could combine something like that with um, a sort of a ligand model to see um, um, yeah, what, what proportion of those, uh, to maybe rather than just having ratios, maybe put actual sort of absolute values on those concentrations, perhaps that yeah, might be a way. So the reason why I used copper was because um, I didn't have the thermodynamic Data available to do the model for zinc. Um, so I needed I needed to have sort of the you know the equilibrium constants for the copper ligand um, binding, um, and I didn't have those for zinc. But uh, so yeah, so the, the, they might exist somewhere, or that maybe people will generate those in the future. And it would be I think it would be great to, um, to expand those to other metals. And um, yeah, you might write that might be a way to kind of to indirectly then constrain the abundance of ligands in in water. Um, so I think it's a really I think it's an important question to figure out how much organic matter was kind of suspended there. And um, but the other question is also how much of that would be binding metals, because I think a lot of the ligands that are binding copper today are kind of sulfide ligands. So they have um, a, a sulfide or thiol group within them. And so um, then the other question would be how much sort of sulfide, sort of organic sulfides were, um, so it would then again depend on a bit on sulfur uh, chemistry as well. So I think it would be, It'll be, a, it's a, it'll be a, big, a big question to figure out and it will probably be uh, difficult, but I think it's important to do, yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right, we can leave maybe 30 seconds or so for anybody who's typing or anybody who wants to pipe up. I can also feel free to email me if you have any, any other questions on interesting samples. And I'll post uh, your email on the website with your uh, talk, if that's okay. Sure. So I think you mentioned that next time um, Richard Ernst is speaking about uh, sort of hotspots of yeah. human volcanism in the Precambrian. So I think it would be also interesting to see how how this, you know, I guess sort of subsurface tectonic regime kind of translates into surface processes such as hydrothermal. Yeah, that's similar to what uh, the first question was about. Um, so maybe it'll maybe he'll address that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did find that interesting. How you know the the very first question here was connected to spreading ridges, mm -hmm. and then we think about um, there's so much more talk these days about large igneous provinces through through history. So it will definitely be interesting to get Richard's perspective. Eva. Um, my question was prompted about the, the mid-ocean ridges, was prompted by Kump and Seafried's paper on the pressure dependence of the composition of hydrothermal vent fluids. They were talking yeah. specifically about iron sulfur ratios. I don't mm -hmm. know about the effects for other, uh, uh, for mm -hmm. other elements. Um, mm -hmm. But so I was wondering whether the nature of hydrothermal uh, alteration as observed in the Archean might, might ultimately be able to say whether mid-ocean ridges as opposed to other kinds of hydrothermal systems existed or not. Although the mm -hmm. question is complicated, of course, because we don't know uh, the depth of the mid-ocean ridges at that time, but that's also, of course, something we would mm -hmm. like to constrain. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, because of this pressure dependence, I think this is a very interesting uh, topic as well, of course, mm -hmm. as for the, uh, the issue of uh, nutrients for life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I think, um... I think that to so these hydrothermal systems, they, they tend to be very reducing. They produce hydrogen also in some of the alteration reactions. And so I think that that might also perhaps overpower some of the 
of the pressure dependence, I mean, it is, of course, also pressure dependent, but um, so the SO2 H2S ratio that is kind of pressure dependent in these in magmatic processes um, might then be kind of overruled by just hydrogen projection during, um, during water rock reactions. So at least it's an additional process that would complicate that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but that might be different in the Archean as well, because in the Archean, we would expect to have much thicker uh, basaltic crust. And so there, there would be less access to, to peridotite by seawater. Mm -hmm. And so oh, the reactants point. that are generating the hydrogen, which is mostly serpentinization, might not be as important. Although mm -hmm. the basalts themselves would have, you know, quantitatively slightly more olivine. So that's, mm -hmm. a, you know, another interesting question uh, mm -hmm. about hydrogen production under Archean uh, spreading conditions. Yeah, it's interesting. In the first I mean, order, yeah, so we would expect much thicker uh, you know, oceanic crust in the Archean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. In, in the Southwest Springs group, it's um, maybe I guess it's interesting um, worth pointing out that um, they have found copper deposits and zinc deposits. They are mostly copper, but um, they've never really found something that's really economic. And uh, so they are, I guess, the actual deposits are, are not. They're they're there, but they're not huge. They're not large. And so um, I guess the maybe the oldest really sort of large economic mineral deposit. I'm not sure. So I know. If, Kick Creek in, in, in Canada, so it's 2.7 billion years old. I'm not sure if they are, uh, what's, I guess, what would be sort of the oldest economic large... That may change. Yeah. Okay. Economy, <laughs> economic is a moving target. I guess that's right, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so it's, that's a good point. That, uh, so we don't see these massive, yeah. hugely massive sulfide deposits. That might have to do with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with, um, with all these variables that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, copper would be a good word in a grant, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of bummed that Richard Ernst wasn't able to join today because I feel like just uh, I've, I've been spending a lot of time reading some of the stuff that came, that um, is related to large igneous provinces. And it's I, I just find it really interesting that large igneous provinces can have so many different effects and in one event, it might be suggested that large igneous provinces are pumping a whole lot of phosphorus into the system, while in another Yeah, event, but they're still 40 times less important than seafloor spreading. Yeah, yeah, because but I mean... Because large igneous province for one million years doubles the rate of magma production, but they only but, occur once every 40 million years. So relative to seafloor spreading, uh, I mean, their manifestations are important, don't get me wrong, but... Well, that's why they're connected to yeah, events, right? right? It's a big en engine that's running all the time. Right, right. And I mean, it, it, if we're looking at events, they're always connected to something bigger because they're, they're large flux more sort of almost instantaneously in geologic time or over five yeah. mi million years. Yeah, no, as far as rates are concerned, which is very important, and they're, they're, they're huge. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious that, you know, most of the mass extinction Anthropogenic mass extinctions are related to volcanic events, right? But going back to them, you know, providing a whole lot of potential, depending on where the large igneous province is in place, you know, if you're, you know, providing a lot of phosphorus through weathering, if you're also providing a lot of nitrogen through increased activity or through ammonia, like you're, you're suggesting, then that could be sort of a double whammy. Yeah, I guess you need, so in, in my case, you would need to have kind of sediments associated with that. So they would just be recycling pre-existing nitrogen, but maybe you could uh, have some sort of you know, positive feedbacks that stimulate nitrogen fixation and deposition on the seafloor. And then you also have additional recycling of that. So yeah, it might, might work, yeah. Yeah, yeah active volcanism is important uh, sub because you get the fresh, you know, you know, unweathered surface every time you get a lava flow. Mm -hmm. So to, to really, it's a good way of jacking up the weathering rates, which are they, you know normally just ultimately tectonically dependent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eva. Um, this yeah. was really great, and uh, as as usual, we did get a whole lot of really good discussion at the end. Um, yeah. So, thanks again for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so look forward to seeing everybody again in two weeks for Richard Ernst's. Uh, to talk about large igneous provinces, and maybe we can we can uh, ask him about some of these questions. Um, until then, everybody have a have a good couple of weeks. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye. 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 Andre, you looks like you're in you're in a solar proton event.
Yeah, I'm just at home, so I'm trying to keep my bedroom <laughs> closed.